Uh, your first guest speaker this evening, uh, an absolute legend of a man. I've had the privilege of meeting him a few times and I really enjoy his company. I don't think he's that bothered about meeting me again, but you know what I mean? It's just the way it goes, isn't it? But he's a nice bloke and I know he's been sat next to your chairman, Eddie, so it may be difficult for him to try and get going when he stands up. And um, he does look a bit bored shitless, to be honest with you, you know what I mean? <laughs> But I know that Eddie is a big, big fan of Liverpool. I've been listening to him, and Jan's such a nice bloke. What he's done, because um, he's a chairman of your great club, he's brought along a little gift for you, Eddie. Um, he didn't want to give it to you himself because he worried that he'd start speaking to him again. <laughs> um, he's dug it out of the archives. It's a video entitled Liverpool FC: The Glory Years. It's a nice one, that. So I'd like to pass that to you on behalf of Jan. <laughs> It's chuffed to bits now, is Eddie. You will obviously need a Betamax video player with that one. <laughs> but uh, the man I'm just about to uh, introduce, what, what, what a fantastic player he was back in the day. Uh, he's been there and done it, a lovely bloke as well. And uh, I'll just tell you a quick story. I'm, I'm, I love my football, me, and I've got a book at home, a book entitled Liverpool's 100 Greatest Footballers. And that man at the side of me, Jan Malby Wright, He's read it as well. <laughs> You're in for a treat, lads. Let's, let, let, let's give him a really, really big welcome. Gentlemen, the one and only, Jan Mulbe. Thank you, Pete, and uh, good evening, all. Now, just in case there is one or two people in the room who don't quite remember me when I used to play, let me just give you some of my manager's favourite quotes about me. Joe Fagan, who signed me, once said, it's probably the best £175,000 I ever spent. <laughs> Kenny Dalglees said, he's the most natural two-footed player I've ever seen. And Graham Sooner said, Jan is the only player ever to put on fucking weight during a game. <laughs> now, I just have to tell you this story. Uh, I don't normally tell this story, but we, we had a, a former players meeting on Wednesday at Anfield and uh, Ronnie Whelan and Ronnie's a great storyteller, and he turns up at a meeting and uh, he's all excited, he goes, you're not going to believe this, lads. And we go, what? He said, I've just been on a cruise for two weeks, and when we came home the other day, my daughter's home from university, and she just goes, Mum and Dad, I've got something to tell you. And they go, all right, what? She goes, I'm a lesbian. And we were going, <laughs> fuck, you know, what did you do, Ronnie? Oh, he says, uh, to reward her honesty, he said, I bought a video camera. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, anyway, I uh, started my football career back home in Denmark. I know there's probably one or two people in this room who might believe that I was the first scout ever to play for Denmark. <laughs> And in 1982, at the age of 18, I was transferred to Ajax of Amsterdam. Transfer fee was £110,000. That at the time, believe it or not, was the biggest fee any Danish club had ever received. I signed a three-year contract, and on the first day of pre-season, I walked into a dressing room full of players like Marco van Basten, Frank Rijkaard, Ronald Koeman, Jes Bolsen, who later went on to play for Manchester United, and also who I consider to be the second best player the world's ever seen, a 37-year-old Johan Cruyff. Now I'm sure you all know who Johan Cruyff is. He played for Ajax late 60s, early 70s. He then went to Barcelona and then on to America. A lot of people generally thought after his spell in America that he retired, but he didn't. In 1981, at the age of 36, he returned to Dutch football on Ajax. And when he came back in the early 80s, Dutch football at that time was generally struggling. There wasn't a lot of people going to games, therefore there wasn't a lot of money about. So what Cruyff said to Ajax was, he said, listen, I'll sign a two-year contract. He said, and you just pay me whatever you can afford. He said, now I'll just gamble on making up my money by bringing back the crowds. He said, at the moment, your average gate is 13,000. 
He said, whatever that average gate will be at the end of the first season, I'm here. And again, likewise, at the end of the second season, I'm here. He said, whatever is in excess of the 13,000 you've got at the moment, he said, we'll just split that 50-50 between you, the club, and myself. Now, believe it or not, at the time, the club thought, what a great way of getting him back. They didn't have to commit to money that they didn't have. Now, Ajax back in those days would use two stadiums for the home games. They had a small stadium that held 29,000 people. And of course, back in the 80s, the Olympic state of Amsterdam would sell 63,000 people. In Johan Cruyff's first season, 1981-82, the club won a domestic double in the league and the cup. And every single home game at the smaller stadium was a complete sellout. 29,000 people. So you work that out yourself. Average gate of 29,000 people. That is 16,000 people above the average for when he joined to be split between Johan and the club for 17 home games. Believe me, that was an astronomical amount of money back in those days. In Cruyff's second season, 82-83, which was my first season at Ajax, the club had no choice. They moved every single home game, Olympic State of Amsterdam. Again at the end of the season, we won the domestic double, we won the league and the cup, and at the end of the season, the average gate is 45,000. <laughs> now, I know Cruyff's a great, great player. But look at it like this. In Cruyff's first season back at Ajax, the average gate was 29,000. In my first season at Ajax, <laughs> the average gate was an incredible 45,000. So, you know, when I said before, I thought Cruyff was the second best player the world had ever seen. <laughs> now, leading up to the final game of the season, it's a home game. Johan Cruyff is only days away from being out of contract, and all everybody's talking about what's a great man going to do. He came out two days before, before the game to announce that he was going to play for one more year. He said, of course, I want to play for Ajax. He said, well, as you know, I have an agreement, and if we can't stick to that, he said, I will go elsewhere. The day before the game, the club came out to announce that under these terms, sorry, but we can no longer afford to keep him. So we're playing, final home game of the season. We've got 63,000 men inside the stadium. We come into the dressing room at half-time. We're winning 5-0. And as we walk into the dressing room, the first thing you see on the floor it's the number nine kit that Johan Cruyff will wear in the first half. And one of the players goes, I see Johan's kits on the floor, where is he? And somebody else goes, oh, he's stripped off. He's jumped in the bath. So the coach goes, oh, he said, I better go and have a word with him. So he walks into the shower area where Johan Cruyff's in the corner of the bath, having a Marlboro. And the, and the coach goes, uh, Johan, he says, uh, what are you doing? Oh, he says, uh, I I'm going to head off home. He said, what do you mean you're going to head off home? It's only half time. He said, yeah, I know that, he said, but I just feel that this would be the best time for me to go. So the coach was, okay, he said, I accept that. He said, but could you tell me why now? He said, after all, we've got a full stadium. They know you're leaving, but they also know you're the greatest player they've ever seen and probably ever will see. And they want to say their farewells. So why right now? Well, Troy says, uh, just as you kick off the second half at four o'clock, there will be an announcement on radio that I'm joining Feyenoord. <laughs> now... <laughs> For the benefit of people who don't know, <laughs> still to this very day, he's the only footballer ever to go from Ajax to Feyenoord. And nobody has ever gone from Feyenoord to Ajax because of the hatred between these two clubs. And Cruyff goes on to say, and when those 63,000 fucking nutters out there find out, he said, uh, he said, I'd rather be at home. <laughs> <laughs> He's gone home, we've gone out to play the second half. As you can imagine, as soon as the news breaks, the fans are going berserk. Anything they get their hands on, they're ripping up seats, chucking stuff on the pits, and the, the atmosphere, as you can imagine, got really, really horrible. And believe it or not, it affected us, the home team, to the extent that with 10 minutes to go, the scoreline, incredibly, was 5-5. But with about seven minutes to go, yes, Bolson have scored to make it 6-5. And I always remember, with about a minute to go, I was just standing in the middle of the park, <laughs> <laughs> because that's what I used to do, you see. And, uh, I was thinking, would it be nice with maybe a lap of honour, a bit of celebration? After all, we just won a domestic double, but you kind of sense with the mood and the stand, there'll probably be a better day, you know. And the final whistle have come, and I've never seen anything like it. About 45,000 fans have climbed over the fence and made their way onto the pits. Both sets of players chased down the dressing rooms, where we were barricaded inside the dressing room for eight hours while the fans wrecked everything they could possibly get their hands on. Johan Cruyff, of course, went on to play for, for final for one year. And with him in the team, they won the Dutch Championship. But I tell the story for two reasons. The first reason being, of all the players I've ever played with, even at 37, 
he was the best. I believe in world-class players, but I also believe that throughout history, we have maybe six or seven players who are just better than being world-class. And I believe he was one of them. And believe me, it was an incredible 12 months. And the second reason I tell this story is that, well, I guess uh, you'll never have another fucking speaker here who's played with Johan Cruyff. So. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, at the end of that second season, summer of 1984, we'd been out to France for the European Championships with Denmark. It was the first time Denmark had ever qualified for any major championships in football. Beaten by Spain in the semi-finals on penalties, I came back to Ajax. I had a year left on my contract. As soon as I returned from pre-season training, I was called to a meeting with the coach and the chairman. And as I walked into the office, the first thing I saw was a little board in the corner. It had three names on it. It said Frank Reichardt, Ronald Koeman, Jan Mulvey. I thought... Apart from the order, that looks okay to me, doesn't it? <laughs> Chairman goes, Yanni said, uh, I can see you notice the board. You know how we do business. He said, every summer we try and sell some of our players to try and balance the books. And the three names on the board are the three players we're going to sell. Now, you've been one of them. Do you have a preference where you like to go? So I said, yeah, I'd love to go to England. I was brought up as in, on English football back home in Denmark as a young boy. I could have joined Ipswich Town in 1981. Bobby Robson wanted to sign me. But I thought at 17, I was a bit too young. But three years later, 20 years of age, Played 71 games for Ajax, scoring 21 goals, had 22 caps to my name. I was ready. So Ajax set a fee of £175,000, informed all top flight clubs in England, and three of those clubs came back and agreed a fee. They were Crystal Palace, Manchester City, and Sheffield Wednesday. Now, I have to be honest, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't quite what I'd hoped for. but uh, <laughs> I did, however, verbally agree a three-year contract with Sheffield Wednesday. And the day before I'm due to fly to Manchester Airport to meet Howard Wilkinson to sign for Sheffield Wednesday, I get a phone call from Liverpool Football Club. It was the then chief scout, Tom Saunders. He said, listen, Jan, he said, uh, we've just sold some bloke called Graham Sooners to Sampdoria and we're looking for a replacement. Now, we've never seen you play, but you do come highly recommended. He said, but the only way this is going to happen is if you're prepared to ring Howard at Sheffield and tell him you're joining Liverpool on a 10-day trial. He said, at the end of those 10 days, he said, we might, he said, but we might not offer you a contract. He said, but the gamble is yours. And I thought, once in a million, got to do it. So I said, yeah, I'll come. Spoke to Howard, he said, not a problem. If they don't want you, get the train up here. He said, we'll still sign you. <coughs> so I'm joining Liverpool on a 10-day trial. I mean, what do you do on trial? Play a bit of football. I knew I could play. I didn't know whether I was quite good enough for Liverpool or not at the time. But I've turned up, and the trial has been exactly like I thought it was going to be. I've trained with the first team in the mornings. I've also played in one or two practice matches in the evenings. And I was also introduced to one or two other things while I was there. <laughs> one, of, one of them being Bruce Gobbler, who uh, very kindly introduced me to Scousers. <laughs> I'd only been in Liverpool for four days. It was a Sunday evening, 7.30. I was in my hotel room in the city centre. There's a knock on the door. Now, some of you might remember this. 1984 was the year that Bruce Gobbler was voted the best-dressed man in Britain. Do you remember you used to see him out in public? Long Max hats. And as I've just said, there's a knock on the door. I've opened the door and there he is, Bruce, wearing his Long Mac and his hat. I said to him, I said, uh, well, what can I do for you? <laughs> because that, that's how I spoke English at the time, you see. Uh. He said, hey, my boy, he says, I've come to take you partying. I said, but well, Bruce, I said, where I come from, mainland Europe, Sunday night, people tend to stay in, rest, and then they go to work Monday morning. Oh, yeah, he said, but we're in Liverpool now. He said, and people go party on Sunday night. Don't go to work Monday. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I got myself ready. And we got into this wine bar called Streets of Wine Bar in Liverpool. And as soon as we got in there, Bruce was going straight up to the bar. He saw the pint of lager and the pint of Guinness. He's handed me the pint of lager. He's then disappeared. I never saw Bruce again until the following morning, 10 o'clock for training. So I'm standing at the bar in Liverpool. I'm 20 years of age. And I just looked for it. I had one of them foreign jumpers on, you see, you know when you go on holiday? <laughs> and you look at that one fella and you go, where the fuck's he from? <laughs> <laughs> but you know what it's like in Liverpool, Scousers can't help themselves. It lasted 20 seconds. Scouser comes right up to me. He looks me up and down and he goes, all right there, mate, he said, uh, where are you from then? I said, I'm from Denmark. He went, Denmark? He said, do you know Liverpool Football Club? They got one of them Denmark footballers on trial. Do you know him like? I said, oh, no. I said, I've never heard of him. <laughs> ah, never mind, he said. I've heard he's fucking crap anyway. <laughs> 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 
Anyway, the 10 days went well. Liverpool offered me a three-year contract, which, of course, I signed. And then you need to try and get a game in the first team. Now, back in those days, as a young player, the norm would be for you to play six or 12 months in the reserves to learn the Liverpool way. I didn't. I made my debut three days later. Now, believe me, there's a million things you remember about your debut. My debut was against Norwich City. I remember getting to Carroll Road at 5-2, to two, 65 minutes before kickoff. Joe Fagan, 63 years of age, is our manager. He stands up in the dressing room, he goes, Grobola, Neil, Hanson, Lawrence and Kennedy. Lee, Walk, Mulby, Whelan. Russ, Dalgleis, Johnson. And walks off. I'm thinking, wonder what the fuck that was. <laughs> <laughs> Now, uh, I soon learned it was a team talk, you know. <laughs> the next problem, getting changed. When I used to play for Denmark and Ajax, we started to get changed about two hours before games. But I'm well aware that in England it's entirely different. So what I've decided to do is, I'll just sit, watch what the rest of them do, and whatever they do, I'll just follow suit. Now, in terms of getting changed, there isn't a great deal happening. It's quarter past two, 20 past two. Believe it or not, there wasn't even one Liverpool player, 20 past two, 40 minutes before kickoff, who took his tie off. The first Liverpool player to make a move at 25 past two is Mark Lawrence. And as Lotto stands up, I'm kind of hoping he's going to get changed because at least then I can start to. And to be fair to Mark, as soon as he's on his feet, off comes his jacket, off comes his tie, off comes his shirt. And I'm right next to him, getting ready as quickly as I possibly can. Although I have to say, thinking back 29 years ago, I'm not always convinced that's one of the best decisions I ever made. Being one of only two naked men in that dressing room. <laughs> Especially when the other one is fucking Mark Lawrence. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's only a rumour anyway. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Matter day will never be the same again, will it? Okay, no. <laughs> anyway, 20 to 3, all 12 players have changed. We're as ready as we're ever going to be. But I still only know two things. I know I'm playing for Liverpool. I know I'm wearing number 10. The reason I know I'm wearing number 10, I was seated in between number 9 and number 11. <laughs> Now, number nine, the great man himself back in the 80s, also became, and still to this very day, my best friend in football and needs very little introduction, Ian Rush. And number 11 is John Wall. And as I just told you, I'm desperate for information. So I'm looking at Rushy, and you probably know as well as I do, Rushy's not the sharpest tool in the box, you know, so uh, <laughs> I thought I'd leave him. <laughs> I've turned to John Walk and I said, go on then, John. I said, give us a clue. 20 minutes before kickoff, English dressing rooms. I said, what happens next? Oh, Jan, he said, uh, this will be a brand new experience for you. He said, here, we don't do anything collectively. He said, anything you need to do or you have to do, he said, you have to do on your own. He said, but of course, the longer you stay with us, you will get used to it. He said, but here's a piece of advice, he said. Over there in that corner, he said, with the staff having a cup of tea. He said, I'm sure if you go over there and ask them any questions, they'll be more than happy to help. So I'm walking across the dressing room floor, and in the corner, we've got Joe Fagan, the manager, Ronnie Ryan, assistant manager, Roy Evans, first team coach. And before I can get over there, the assistant manager has already spotted me. He turns around, he looks at me and he goes, uh, Hello there, he said, uh, what can we do for you then? And I'm thinking, maybe a little bit of massage just to loosen the muscles would be nice. <laughs> maybe even a warm-up just to get your heart rate going just before kick-off. Maybe even some food that doesn't come wrapped in fucking newspaper, you know. <laughs> I do, however, realise that asking for all those things just before kick-off would be greedy. So all I said was, I said, listen, I said, I just wondered, would there possibly be one piece of information you could give me that would help me understand what exactly like me to do once we get out there at three o'clock? And before Ronnie could answer, Joe Fagan, the manager, looks at me and he goes, oh, yeah, uh, he said, uh, you just like the fucking rest of them. I went, pardon? He said, foreigners. He said, you're all the fucking same. I said, I don't understand what you mean. He says, well, haven't you come up here to ask us three? what we think is going to happen out there at 3 o'clock. I said, well, yeah, I said, but that is the kind of information I normally get before I play. Ah, he said, let me tell you, I haven't got a fucking clue what's going to happen out there. <laughs> <laughs> he said, but I will promise you, Jan, he said, when you come back in at 4.45, I will be the first one to let you know whether you've got a fucking clue or not. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, yeah, yeah, this will do for me, this is the place for me, so... Uh, <laughs> I decided to hang around for a little while, 12 years in total. Now, during my 12 years at Anfield, 
I became the longest serving foreign player at any one British club. Also during my 12 years at Anfield, I became the record scorer of penalties in the history of Liverpool Football Club, scoring 42 penalties. I also became the first player in top flight football to score a hat-trick of penalties, which happened in 1986 at Anfield against Coventry City. Now you would think that that game, when we won 3-1, would be famous for my hat-trick of penalties. But it's not. The game is famous because it was the first time, as a six-year-old, Steven Gerrard watched the first team play at Anfield. <laughs> and you know when he picks up a ball now to take a penalty? And his record is he scores 77% of his penalties. I've often wondered how different that could have been if he'd have paid a bit of fucking attention. <laughs> Anyway, main memories are from the 80s. I think there can be very little doubt that for the short spell probably in the 80s, we were probably the greatest clubs out anywhere in the world. The most memorable game I ever played in was the 1986 FA Cup final. I mean, when I came across in the mid-80s, people always used to say to me, what made you come to England? Because in those days, people used to go to Italy. That's where the fame, that's where the glory was. I said, I came to England to play in a cup final at Wembley. And as I've just told you, I managed to do that in 1986. It wasn't actually the first time I'd ever played at Wembley. The first time I ever played at Wembley was in 1983 European qualifier, England nil, Denmark won. Yeah! I, uh, I do enjoy telling that one in Scotland and Wales. So to say. <laughs> the second time I played at Wembley was in 1984 Charity Shield, Everton won, Liverpool nil. I don't know if you remember that day, but Bruce Gobler scored a non goal that day. So, uh, well, I can tell you what he told me on a Friday night. We were sitting in a reception hotel and Bruce had this piece of paper and he goes, uh, do you know what, Jan? He said, uh, I'm just having a little look here and I think I'm a bit of fucking value at 66 to want to get the first one. <laughs> now also during the 80s, now also during the 80s came the greatest goal I've ever scored for Liverpool. Now you know when you score great goals, there is no need for you to stand up and tell people about them. Because more often than not, you would have seen these goals again and again and again. However, this goal that I scored on the 26th of November 1985 at Anfield in front of 42,000 people is slightly different. Because unless you were there, you might never have seen this goal. And the reason, and some of you might remember, that for the first half of the 85-86 season, due to an internal strike at the BBC, there was no cameras at any games. And during that period, I've scored this goal. And because I know that most of you weren't there, I know it's a great goal. <laughs> I, I'm just going to talk you through it. <laughs> the game was against Manchester United. Now, Manchester United had equaled the top flight record that season of winning the first 10 league games of the season. And they come to Anfield on a Wednesday night, they give us a bit of a going over, we're getting beat 1 0. Paul McGrath has scored in the seventh minute in the cup ends. We're into the second half, 57th minute. There's a 50-50 challenge, 75 yards from goal, right on a touch line in front of the dugout between Norman Whiteside and myself. I've won the challenge against Whiteside. I've gone to the other side and I'm thinking, I'm just going to play this forward to Russell Douglas. Can't see no Liverpool players in front of me. All behind me, that's how far back we've been pushed. All I can see, Brian Robson, Paul McGrath, Gordon Strachan, left back Clayton Blackmore, two centre-halves, Graham Hock and Kevin Moran. So I'm thinking... It's probably highly unlikely that if I build up a bit of momentum, <laughs> that there'll be anyone quick enough to get up and support me. You know? so, uh, I might have to do this on my own. So I've set off. I've gone past Brian Robson. I've gone past Paul McGrath. And as I'm crossing the halfway line, left back Clayton Blackmore sort of gets in the way. So I'll push him out of the way. And now I've just got the two centre halves left. Now, Graham Hawk. Even a lot of Manchester United fans struggled with that name. He wasn't necessarily a great Manchester United player. The other fellow, however, Kevin Moran. Now, Kevin is a really, really good player. And he's a bit of a fucking lunatic, you know. So, <laughs> so I'm thinking, I'll go past Hawk. He won't give me too many problems. And before I get to the loon, I'll just hit it. <laughs> so, I've, <laughs> so I've set off. I've gone past Graham Hawk. And from 25 yards, I've hit this shot. And you know yourself, golf, cricket, football, when you hit one, you know. As soon as I left my boot, only one place is gone. And it's gone like a missile into the top corner, hit the stanchion, 
back out before half the crowd realises it's a goal. That's half the story. Most people inside Anfield didn't realise. Stanchion, back out, great goal. Uh, anything wrong with it? Sometimes I do wonder uh, whether I might have scored that goal about four years too early. Uh, because if I could stand up tonight and tell you that Peter Schmeichel wasn't goal, I know you'd be impressed. Uh, because Gary Bailey fucking spoils it, doesn't he? <laughs> Anyway, if anyone is interested, when you wake up in the morning, go on YouTube, put in Jan Mulby, that goal, you will be able to see it. Because in 2010, there is a copy. It's not a great copy, but it is available on YouTube. Have a little look. When you look, we haven't done anything with the speed of the table, nothing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, out of the 80s and into the 90s, and uh, again, one of these iconic games on Merseyside. It was an FA Cup replay at Goodison Park. They ended Everton 4, Liverpool 4. At the end of that game, Kenny Dalglish decides he's had enough. Eventually, we get ourselves a new manager, Graham Sooners. Now, the thing with Sooners is that I'm sure that people who remember him as a player will agree on his day in his position, as good as you're ever going to get. I also think that a lot of people who remember him as a Liverpool player will agree, a Liverpool manager will agree. He was shit, wasn't he? <laughs> And you know when he came back to manage Liverpool in 1991? He'd been out to Italy for three years as a player. He then went up to Scotland for four years as a player manager. So believe me, he picked up a lot of new, a lot of new ideas. And when he came back to Anfield, he changed as many things as he could overnight. Down at the training ground, total revamp. New pitches to train on, new canteen, new dressing rooms. I mean, even put this small building at the end of one of the dressing rooms. It took us a few weeks, we discovered it was a fucking gym, you know. <laughs> But due to his three years in Italy, he'd become totally obsessed with one thing and one thing only, fitness. And we come in for training one Monday morning, he calls a meeting in the main dressing room, sits us all down, 23 senior pros. He goes, listen lads, he said, uh, when I look at this squad, what I see is so many players, late 20s, early 30s. He said, now whether you like it or not, that is the age where you start to lose some of your natural fitness and also you will start to put on some weight. He said, so what I've done after training, I've got this guy coming in, he's a dietitian." and he'll spend five minutes with each of you. And at the end of those five minutes, you'll all have something that we call you match weight. He said, and when we weigh you every Friday morning at 9.30, you have to be on your match weight or lighter. He said, if not, you don't play on a Saturday. He said, and before any of you say anything, I'm well aware this football club has never had a pair of scales. He said, so I've just bought, for two and a half thousand pounds, a speak your weight machine. <laughs> so we come in for this first Friday morning at this speak your weight machine, Ian Russell and myself get there about 20 past nine. Half nine, we're starting to queue. And because we're getting weighed in the Fisher's office, the Fisher's only got a small office, so we're all sort of queuing out through the door and down the corridor, all 23 of us. And you kind of know what it's like when a big group of lads are getting weighed. The people at the back are always a giveaway, aren't they? I mean, I'm last, you know. <laughs> right in front of me is Neil Ruddock. <laughs> <laughs> But because it's the speak your weight machine, while you're waiting, you can actually hear it. It's going 11 stone 8, 10 stone 6. And I'm thinking, wonder what the fuck they're weighing. <laughs> it, can't, it can't be an old person, can you know what I mean? If anything, I'm in there, I was 10 to 10 on a Friday morning, I'm 6 to 9. There he is in the corner, 37 years of age. Black pair of shorts rolled up, tight black t-shirt, not an ounce of fat. He's gone, morning, Jan. I said, morning, Gaffer. He said, uh, are you looking forward to this big fella? I said, oh, personally, I said, uh, I can't wait. <laughs> I said, I do, however, know that a few of the chubby ones have been a little bit worried about it. I said, uh, I said, but I don't, you, I said, I don't know if you know. I said, but just before you came back to Manus Liverpool, I did sign a brand new four-year contract. So uh, <laughs> there might be a few fucking weekends off at this rate, you know what I mean? <laughs> No, 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 he said, Jan, don't be like that. I'm not just picking on you. He said, this is a general thing with the whole squad. He said, and as you know, if we deal with this, you will play better, you will play longer. He said, you know, I want you out there every Saturday. He said, but you have to do me a favour. Before you're done with no scales, tell me, what's the lightest you've ever been? I said, well, Gaffer said, uh, this you might find hard to believe. I said, but I was once seven pound three ounces. <laughs> Anyway, just before I go, I did mention before my friendship with the great man himself, Ian Russ, 
And I have enough material to tell you, genuinely enough stories for about 45 minutes. And people always say, how come you know so much about him? That's because I was always with him. 24 hours a day, we were always together. Like the Pizza Hut story, you know, where the waitress comes up and she goes, Mr. Rush, would you like me to slice a pizza into four or eight slices? Oh, four, he said. Uh, There's no way I could eat eight. <laughs> First live game of the 85-86 season was on a Sunday in January, Watford versus Liverpool. We're staying in a hotel on a Saturday night, we're in our rooms, 9 o'clock at night. The fire alarm goes off. Do you know what it's like when you stay in a hotel, the fire alarm goes off? You put your clothes on, you go and stand outside the hotel for 10 minutes, then they tell you, false alarm, back to your rooms. Well, this night, the fire alarm goes off again at 4 o'clock in the morning. This time, however, Rushy doesn't wake. So I'm having to shake him. And eventually he wakes and he goes, what do you want? I said, fire alarm. He's gone, oh, for fuck's sake, he said. I hope it's not another false alarm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's have a little fire somewhere, you know. <laughs> anyway, final and best favourite Ian Rush story. 1985, Stafford and Fitzgerald were going to have a charity cricket match at a place called Formby Cricket Club, which is just on the outskirts of Liverpool. The cricket match is due to start on a Sunday at 12 o'clock. You'll also remember that in the 80s, on a Sunday, bars would open between 12 and 2. So the cricket club rung the football club and said, listen, by the time you finish your cricket match, the bar will be closed. So if you want anything, bring your own food, bring your own drink. So the staff at Anfield got all the players together and said, listen, everybody, and we mean everybody, bring some food, bring some drink. We'll have a great day. Now that Sunday morning, 9.30 in the morning, I'm up in North Wales, outside Rushy's mum and dad's house, beating the horn, trying to get them out. On my back seat, I've got beer, wine, burgers, sausages and bread rolls because we've been asked to bring something. Rushy comes out of the house, jumps in the car, he's bought fuck all. <laughs> I said, are you not bringing anything then? No, he says, I'm not. I said, any reason? Well, he says, I've been thinking. And I think if everybody brings something, there should be more than enough there. <laughs> So I went, probably, I said, but that's not why we're doing it. I said, we do it as a team bonding exercise. I said, and you and me now turn up at Anfield, and you haven't brought any food, you haven't brought anything. I said, one or two of the boys might not be too happy. Ah, never mind, he said, just fucking drive. <laughs> so I'm driving in towards Liverpool, we get to a place called Birkenhead. 10 past 10 on a Sunday morning, there's a little Sainsbury's. He goes, I'll go on, and he says, pull over. i better go and get something. So he runs into Sainsbury's, he's back out two minutes later, he's bought a bag of ice. <laughs> Chucks the bag of ice in the back seat, jumps in the front. I went, you bought ice? Oh, yeah, yeah, and he said, uh, I bought the ice so we can put in our drinks later this afternoon. I said, well, yeah, I said, I kind of got it there. I said, but there is a problem with that. I said, because it'll take us 15 minutes to get to Anfield. And once we get to Anfield, we jump on the first team coach at Formby, which is another 35 minutes. I said, it'll probably be melted by then. Oh, yeah, yeah, he said, uh, I never even thought of that. <laughs> I better go and get another bag. <laughs> anyway. Anyway, great to come and see you. Thanks for listening. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Gentlemen, once again, absolutely fantastic. What a fantastic bloke and a great speaker. Please show appreciation once more for the one of them.